Okay. <laughs> yeah, hello. Um, my name is Ralf Bart. I'm working, let's say, in Deutsche Börse in the application development and architecture area. And let's say I want to talk a little bit about, let's say, how we are using InfiniBand in our infrastructure, especially for the Eurex system, which is our derivative system, uh, so for options and futures. So let's say now coming to something completely different than we had, I think, before, which was all more or less related to the HPC stuff, maybe some memory stuff. We are use it for us. It's more or less a question how we use it in in such a kind of exchange application. Exchange application at that point, I'm talking here, is really the back end. So the software which is running at the exchange itself. So I'm not talking about the client applications, which are sending all the stuff to our system and receiving all the things we are producing somehow out of that. There's another talk which will probably deal more with these patterns. So I will focus on the on the core system. Um, yeah. Developed was the whole system already, let's say, nearly eight years ago as a starting point. We started with the, for, uh, with the international security exchanges in New York, which was at that point in time bought by Deutsche Börse and or Eurex, and so we had to replace the existing system they used because it was coming from another company, which was also now owned by another exchange. So it's a simple thing, you cannot run the software any longer. Um, in addition, there is a license of the software running on the Bombay Stock Exchange. They use the same kind of software for their cash market. And But besides the Eurex system, uh, now we are planning in some migration phase also to use it for the cash market stuff. Um, what we have done in that phase was, okay, we have to think about how to develop the system, what can we do uh, as a kind of, what is our core business, what is the things we should buy somewhere. And so there was a kind of yeah, beauty contest, we evaluated some kind of already buyable middleware, we compared it with some open source software and we compared it with also some kind of yeah, development by another third party provider. At the end of the point, let's say we had decided, and that's more or less just the history, why the kind of technology and looks like, like it is, we decided to use a product which was at that point coming from IBM. Don't want to tell too much in detail about the thing, it's just as, a, as it is as it is. For some more details, how the exchanges itself look like, I have put some of the, of the links inside, so some things, some details about the technology behind, so whoever is interested for offline reading, feel free. So what are the requirements which are somehow driving the, the design we had in the beginning? So one of the major things was, it's that point in time, all about latency. So what was really the point? So whatever was expected, the system should behave with very low latencies and very predictable latencies. This just means really not in the meaning only of a high throughput or low latency to reach high throughput, but it was also in the meaning that a per transaction latency is relevant. That's really the one of the maybe differences you have sometimes in the high performance area or something, a computing area. So the member side, they're really interested, I'm entering an order, when does it reach the exchange and when does I see the first response? How fast the whole exchange reacts on my single order? Not in the meaning what is happening all over the day, really in that moment I'm entering something and then what is the first response I've got from the system and how fast it reacts in a kind of when some kind of matching happens. So that's the point. Consistent latency and throughput is, let's say, as important as the minimum latency as its own. I mean, for sure, minimum latency may give you some indicators about the throughput you may reach, but so the, the averages are more or less re not relevant. Mediums are okay, a first indicator, but from an outside perspective and reaction on the market, let's say, for example, really this kind of 99% numbers, so how many of 
So to see how long does 99% of my transactions or 99.99% of my transactions really take time in the system. And that's the last point, that's availability. I mean, you are a provider of an infrastructure service. So you have to be there all the time. Nobody in the market will accept that you say, sorry guys, we are closed for two hours. Yeah? So you have to make a system working in the way that you say we can somehow rec uh, fulfill the requirements. We are open in the morning and we are closing in the evening. You should be available at least five days a week. Weekends, luckily up to now, typically are not trading phases, so we have at least some minor phases where we can do something. But nevertheless, the availability is also a real, real important point. So, just to give you a rough estimation, what is the kind of patterns and volumes we are talking actually. This is kind of, during the last two years, a uh, volume which we have reached. So you see, let's say, in a, in a rough estimation, some kind of increasing, increasing, still increasing volume pattern in the meaning of transactions. So, yeah, what, what you can say, averages starting, let's say, in the beginning, let's say something around that region of 35 million, then depending what happens in the market, <coughs> going up to values we have now in the region, lucky enough for, for an exchange, let's say up to 70 million. And the other side gives you, let's say, more or less the pattern what we can have tried to reach, let's say, in the meaning of overall round trip times. So this is really something to say, okay, entering the system, doing the first processing, matching and so on, creating some responses and so on, and let's say sending out the next, the answer to the member side again. So to see that, let's say, so we are here in the region, let's say, yeah, below 400 microseconds. That is somehow the, the, the overall number we are actually are. So coming, making, not telling too much about LLM itself, because I mean, okay, it's a product, you can buy it, and I don't want to make any advertisement and whatever, but it has some kind of, yeah, defined somehow the application design. Um, besides the fact that LLM supports, uh, has supports either Ethernet or InfiniBand, so it has a normal so socket interface and a Verbs API support, transparent from the application point of view. So if we are programming, let's say, against the same kind of layer, either if a system runs on Ethernet, which is typically our development area, or in a production system. And besides of that, they have a kind of, and this was the reason why it was also somehow chosen, uh, for this availability point of view, it provides a kind of hot, hot uh, application design. So what you have, you have a real tier. So you have the same application running on two machines, doing the same kind of code. So they're running real hot, hot in the meaning that the same kind of input is processed. We are doing the same kind of processing with all the data. And so you have an identical, for a, dent, well, for a given input stream, you have an identical output. And so you have, let's say this is a kind of, you have simplified a little bit, you have two processes in the two machines in the input area, which do are some processing and providing some data. And you have the next step in a layer tier process here. And you have here a kind of downstream process in the meaning of what is it does it, like a matching engine, for example. And this is processing, let's say, the data from this source and this source in a consistent way in the meaning that this input is completely ordered in a way that whatever you have here in your network, you have the same order of messages guaranteed here. And so we can create the same kind of output here. And that is more or less the beginning point why the network is a multicast network. So whatever we do here, the whole core multi net, um, network communication we have is native InfiniBand multicast. You have a sender, you have multiple receivers, 
So what is the first choice? You don't want to send the data twice. You want to, don't want to pay the offset for multiple sends. So do it the native thing, multicast. And so the whole system is more or less a multicast based system. So this is something one really must have in mind that relevant parts we are doing InfiniBand, yes, but we don't do any kind of the typical point to point InfiniBand. We have all the time more or less a multicast, even simplified. So we have a member participant side, they're talking to our system with regular TCP. Then there is a kind of gateway in front of it, or many gateways, which are a kind of software firewall doing some authentication, authorization, so first kind of boundary to the system. Afterwards, we are talking these LLM-based native InfiniBand, so we are sending these data to a kind of matching engine, which does a core matching, which generates already a first kind of response to the member side which is more or less the first part, which is extreme latency critical part. Everything here is more or less done in memory. And then we have a kind of post-processing, which does all the stuff which are more time consuming, like writing to databases, doing some trade management, which also database driven, audit trailing, all the things you need for regulatory reasons. And which is also in the time critical part, let's say this public market data, which means here, you get a more or less private response, so like my order, your order is accepted, and here you get all the public stuff which says, okay, there was a match, and so many people were in particip involved, and many orders, and this is the thing which goes out here. This is again, in our installation, still classical Ethernet UDP, so also not InfiniBand. More, so, the overall setup then looks a little bit more like you have a partition which we set out of different process types. And so you have one of those partition, another partition, another partition, another partition. And you have, let's say, these kind of gateways in front of it. And again, now we have this point where we come to the factor of reliability in the production setup. Because, okay, you have to run a data center. Not too often it happens, but nevertheless, we must take care about the fact. So we are running in one data center, but at least we are running in two dedicated rooms with dedicated power supply, with all these things you have in a data center to have two rooms completely separated. But, okay, we need a network in between. Because we want to use all the machines. We have a hot, hot system. So all the traffic is always traveling between these two rooms. So what we have is 10 partitions, actually, which are always consisting out of two process pairs. So we have two matching engines running per partition, two trade managers, always such a kind of hot hot implement application implementation. What we did for some performance issues was more or less to say, OK, we want to at least balance a little bit. So we have a kind of locally locality created to say when our participants which are on the high frequency area we should try to avoid any kind of in so not equivalent network passes because people are always dealing with the microseconds and when you're thinking about cable lengths and so on okay not the switching times you have an infinity band of nanoseconds region but let's say you start thinking about cables your same data center and you want to have all the things let's say as fair as possible because that's the other point if you are in the data center, nobody should have any advantage to the fact that he has lost at least 500 nanoseconds due to the fact that he has 20 meters more of cable. So we have the addressing points. So we have, let's say, these points according the several receivers receiving the same kind of data. We want to have simultaneous delivery to all receivers, especially on the output, because we don't want to have, because if you have, can imagine, you have a match, several orders from several members are involved, so you want to give a fair response to everybody, so you cannot send in a given order first to that person, then to that person, then to that person. On that level, the people are aware about the fact and they see the fact that you have some send times between all your single answers. 
And this is again something our members are clever enough to measure this, to observe this, and to compare this, and blame us if we behave at some point in time not in a fair manner. So let's say this is again a kind of reason why do you use, let's say, multicast as early as possible, because it's the only technology on the network which gives you, let's say, kind of simultaneous delivery of data to multiple receivers. So what is the sizing we have? Simply, we have at least ISE is actually running three markets. They have something around 510 nodes in their InfiniBand fabric. And they are using here in that area something around 750 native InfiniBand, also MLITs you see in the network. Eurix is actually a little bit smaller. So we have something around 200 nodes and we have running around, let's say, something around 300 MLITs in the, in the system. So, that point, I want to hand over to my colleague more from the networks department because after our, we decided how our applications took like our poor guys from the operations had to decide how they can provide an infrastructure. <laughs> okay, my name is Joachim Stenzel, so I'm responsible for the hardware. So we have in each location or in each room, we have two InfiniBand server from Mellanox, the IS5200. Uh, and round about six uh, enclosures with 16 nodes inside. Additionally, we have round about 100 rack mount server in each location. So if one location is failed, the other will take over. So everything or every connection is redundant. Uh, here's an example from uh, an enclosure, how it was built and connected to the switch. So uh, we have the uh, Odd and even numbers is in each. Well, the odd is numbers are in one location, the even number in the other location. So, and each of the infinity band switch is directly connected with uh, three connected to each of the switch. <coughs> so we have, okay, additional crossover connection from one location to the other one. So we are using round about um, 45 uh, cables connected to each side. And uh, here's only described how we use the uh, leaf boards. The leaf board uh, one and two is only for the cross connections. The leaf board three to eight is only for the enclosures and the other numbers eight to uh, 12 is only for the rack mounts. So, Here's an example. So we have uh, 45 connections from room to room. So active are in the moment 36 cables and we have nine spare. In case of one of the cables are failed, so we can take over the old or the broken one, we can disconnect and can connect the new one. 12 cables per enclosure to the infiniband switch to, uh, the, um, uh, to the enclosure themselves. And uh, we have connected for each rack mounts two cables. So we are using uh, the uh, BL460 for the rack, uh, for the blade center, and uh, we are using the X3. We have also the Flexlon, so we have additional uh, network connection. And uh, each of the server has 69 gig RAM, and we're using also the 900 gig of this. Each of the blades are the same. We have no difference. So in case of one is failed, so we can take over the spare one and replace it. The same which we have here also with the DL380 is also the same as you can see this here with the 430. Only the addition is here inside. We have uh, we have the fiber channel uh, inside and also the solar flare card for the PTP time. So that is how it looks like the uh, 5200. This is completely. We have two uh, admin boards inside. We have 12 leaf boards and we have also six spine boards. So um, how that should work is we are using the uh, up and down protocol from one room to the other one. 
And this is a short how we configure this one. So how non-critical server, um, the, uh, in the blades are for us this is a non-critical server. So um, that means uh, we have one or more because we have the uh, blade center switch inside. So um, the additional hop takes a little time, so it's not critical for us. And we are using this for the uh, everything, but it's uh, not time critical. So the critical server is the uh, rack mounts. We have one hop less. And we have the uh, higher data throughput. And we have also for the customers, we have an additional sort of aircast inside this 10 gig where the clients can connect directly to. I think that's the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so coming back to the, to the observations, let's say we made or points we are typically now uh, I don't want to say struggling, but which are still point of observations are these things. Um, from application point of view, we have a very dedicated monitoring. So we have a lot of timestamping doing when we receive the data from the network. On the Ethernet part, we have hardware timestamping. We have network tabs, which are doing the kind of when does the first message is seen. So what we see is sporadical, we see during the day. And this is really the thing, you see the numbers, two of the 10 million per day transactions took a little bit longer. And these are the transactions that people are asking, why? Sometimes the members, they blame us because eh, you are too late, so I didn't make the big deal of my, of my life, or I lost a lot of money due to the fact that you're too slow. Uh, and of course, sometimes our management, which says, okay, we have to improve. So, and then people are looking into the thing, and um, if nobody knows anything more about application and, and nobody has an idea what it is, typically the application developer says, okay, it cannot be my application. The kernel developer will say, no, the kernel is also not an issue. We're using at that point, for, uh, just as a remark, the real-time kernel of Red Hat exactly due to some of these latency issues because we are really observing that we have a really sharper latency profile, so less outliers if you use it. So at the end, everybody says, okay, it must be the network. So at some point we had, let's say, done something to, let's say, get things better. Uh, what we have already done is, as we have only one kind of traffic, so we reduce the number of virtual lanes. So whenever we have in a multicast network, maybe a point of possible congestion somewhere due to the fact that you have too much traffic on a port or something, we have said, okay, we don't need these all, so we reduce this already to three. Whether this has had some real impact, it was not that far away now that we really changed this. Again, something, infrastructure provider, we had the discussion about this feature already, let's say, more than one year ago. And, but then you must find the time slot when you're allowed to change your setup of your whole fabric and so on and so on and so on. Many other things ongoing. So at some point it takes more than half a year to come to a conclusion and do such a thing. Um, what we see still that we have many of the InfiniBand counters are in overflow. That's the point, let's say we are just saying, okay, open point, open question. There are many pointers, counters in the InfiniBand which are useful, which gives you a lot of information about what happens in your fabric, but honestly, what does they really mean? It's a little bit kind of education which is somehow missing, same kind of education you have and open questions, meaning how to use the APIs. We have tremendous counters, everything has a meaning, but what does it mean if this counter becomes that number and does it have, for example, some influence that if we have multicast, okay, we have a problem with some of the receiving application, so no credits on the receiver side, what does it mean with the buffers in the switch, what does it mean in a kind of back pressure to the senders? Because you're not losing any data. Still, InfiniBand provides you some kind of reliability here, and we don't see any data losses really here, but you may see some kind of queuing and delay or blocking senders, 
and everything is going in the background. So you don't see whether your data delivery on the sender was blocked due to the fact that at some end point a queue pair was not available any longer. Maybe even due to an application issue. So then another point which is a little bit open for us, for example, for the design is multicast means that you have the forwarding tables. You see you're not using all your switch ports. The normal FAT3 approach to say everything symmetric up down will not help for multicast. You have only one for port forwarding between the switches. So let's say this is also kind of point we are let's say actually discussing how we can continue at that point and how we may improve our setup now. Switch refreshment is ongoing replacement for the 40 gigs to a newer hardware out of lifetime. So we have to continue and thinking about these things and for example, is there some upcoming things in the, in, the, in the layer itself to say how to deal better with a multicast-oriented network in the meaning how the subnet manager may deal with routing information and so on. Okay, that's mainly the main point. Yeah, that's the point I just want to present.